I sometimes think it might have made the grieving process harder for me. And so I want you to hear that up front. That like if you feel like your grief isn't running, you know, through the stages in the way that it's supposed to, I think that's normal. Today I want to talk about grief, the different types of grief, why it doesn't only apply in death, and what it really feels like. And the reason I want to create this video, and I apologize up front if it feels a little rambly or if I share too much about my personal experience, but I lost my dad when I was 24. I always felt like there was this urge when I was grieving to go through the stages. If you aren't familiar, a lot of grief is talked about and through the stages of grief. And this was Kubler-Ross's book. I forget even the title of the books, it's not important, but she discusses these stages. Now these stages are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and ta-da, acceptance. Now these stages are bullshit. And the reason that I believe this to be true is because grief doesn't run along linearly. We don't move through a stage to leave it in the dust and move into the next. Sure, these pieces of it might exist depending on the person. I've talked to a ton of people, even my own family, and a lot of people didn't go through the bargaining stage. They never felt like they did that. Or some people would say, yeah, it was, I never really felt angry. I just was in denial for a long time. So don't feel like you have to go through all of them or that once you go through them, you're finished. Because what I find is that we sort of jump around in the stages as we need to. Like I still feel angry that my dad died and try to bargain with God to bring him back. And he has been dead for over 15 years. So to make me think for so long that something was wrong with me because I wasn't moving through these stages, I sometimes think it might have made the grieving process harder for me. And so I want you to hear that up front. That like if you feel like your grief isn't running, you know, through the stages in the way that it's supposed to, I think that's normal. And I think that we should never have tried to chunk grief into these stages and believe that we're going to move through them and be done. It'd be awesome if that was the case. But through my own experience and my experience with you and other people in my life, I don't believe that to be true. And I think part of our holdup with grief is, first of all, people don't like to talk about death. Now, I'll get into the fact that grief can apply to other things, not just death. But people are afraid to talk about death. It's a hard subject. It's a heavy subject. Um, that's why a lot of people don't plan for their death, don't have wills, don't have any kinds of things in place for things that could happen to them, right, for the loss of life. It's scary, it's final, it's overwhelming. And like many emotions that we don't like, we stuff them down and try to pretend they don't exist. But unfortunately, I feel like the Psychological Association, the APA, the American Psychological Association, also fed into this because only recently, in March of 2022, when the DSM-5 text revision, right here, ta-da, came out, did they finally add prolonged grief disorder to its pages? We used to only be able to talk about it as a stressor in our life or as a way of differentiating it from major depressive disorder or a major depressive episode. And I remember when I was in school, they talked about it as a V code, which we don't use those anymore, but V codes mean that it's not a mental illness or a disorder, but a stressor happening in our lives. And we were told at the time that grief should last only for six months at which point it would be deemed major depressive disorder. And I think that's important to understand because how is it that not until 2022 did our diagnostic manual support the belief and the, really the fact that grief is difficult and that loss of life and loss of loved ones takes a toll. That I think in and of itself kind of supports the fact that we don't like to talk about death. We don't like to talk about grief. It feels very heavy, very overwhelming. And unfortunately, we, we all lose people and we need to talk about it. And as a clinician, as therapists and other mental health professionals, we need to have more ways to support people. So I wanna walk you through, we're going old school video style. I wanna walk you through what prolonged grief disorder really is, okay? Now this was in the previous DSM, the DSM five, see this is the text revision, the TR, the one before this that came out in 2013, I believe, had this in the back as uh, area 
of more studies needed. I forget what the, how the, they exactly phrase it, but prolong, so that's why it's now in this DSM, just as an FYI. Now, prolonged grief disorder is defined, or the diagnostic criteria is as follows. The death at least 12 months ago, so it has to be at least a year ago, of a person who was close to the bereaved individual for children and adolescents has to be at least six months ago. So that's the first part, at least a year or six months. Since the death, the development of persistent grief response is characterized by one or both of the following symptoms, which have been present most days to a clinically significant degree. Now, when they say clinically significant degree, they mean that it impairs our functioning. Like I can't go to school or work. I can't engage in my relationships. I can't do what I normally would do, okay? In addition, so one or more of the following symptoms. And in addition, the symptom has occurred nearly every day for at least the last month. And there's only two, so one, one or both of the following symptoms. You can have an intense yearning and longing for the deceased person. And number two is a preoccupation with thoughts or memories of the deceased person. In children and adolescents, a preoccupation may focus on the circumstances of death. Now, I just wanna pause there because I think most of us would meet that criteria. If you've lost someone really close to you, like if you lost your, your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, uh, your spouse, your child, I think that is very easy to tick boxes, right? Now the next criteria says since the death, at least three of the following symptoms have been present most days to a clinically significant degree. Remember, remember we talked about that. In addition, the symptoms have occurred nearly every day for at least the last month. So again, it's every day for at least the last month. They have an identity dis disruption, mean, meaning that we feel as though part of ourself has died since the death. I think that's also very common. Two, we have a marked sense of disbelief about the death. So remember, we have to have at least three. Three, avoidance of reminders that the person is dead. Like we don't want to look at their items. We don't want to look at photos, which I can be honest with you. It took me a long time. I even remember bawling. So my dad had made me... Oh, I should have brought them out. So cute. I don't want to cry. Pull it together. My dad had made me earrings out of fishing lures back in the day. And I stumbled upon them like not long after he'd passed and like, whoo, couldn't even handle. And it was, but it was definitely a year after he died. So I would have avoided that if I could have. Number four, we have intense emotional pain. Duh. It says anger, bitterness, sorrow related to the death. Five, difficulty integrating into one's relationships and activities after the death. Like we can't engage with friends, pursue interests, or plan for the future. Number six, we have emotional numbness as a result of the death. Number seven, we have a feeling that life is meaningless as a result of the death. And finally, number eight, we have intense loneliness as a result of the death. And remember, we only have to have at least three of those. I think this diagnostic criteria so far seems very common. And to call it prolonged grief disorder, the, the verbiage I feel like could be better because it makes it sound like we're not moving forward like we should. It's prolonged. Like, why are you still doing this? This is too long. You should be over it, right? We don't, what, we get a year and then pff, that's it. But at least we have something. And we have three more little criteria that they talk about. It says, the disturbance causes clinically significant distress an impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of function. That's always part of diagnostic criteria, FYI. The next is that the duration and severity of the bereavement reaction clearly exceeded expected social, cultural, or religious norms for the individual's culture and context. Now, I'm glad that that's there because different cultures celebrate and mourn loss in their own ways, right? There are celebrations of life. There are some cultures that believe, you know, you're supposed to grieve for a certain amount of time. That should be in there. I, I feel like it just, it's like you exceeded it. I, again, the language, right? The judgment, the stigma. And the final part says the symptoms are not better explained by another mental disorder. And again, that's always part of diagnostic criteria. So just wanted you to know, let me pop that down there. Ooh. I just wanted to walk you through what that was because it's nice that we have new language to talk about it. It's nice that the DSM now actually has something more than calling grief a V code and giving us six months because that really limits our ability to talk about it. It limits our ability to get therapy covered if we're going through insurance. And I honestly think it's, it is even more stigmatizing than some of the language that is used in that. But 
at least we have a new way to diagnose and get care. And that can give us access to more support. But I've always hated that they put a time lim limit on grief. And I even hate kind of that it's in the DSM because it makes it sound like grieving for a year or more is a disorder or that like we aren't grieving correctly. And so I want to tell you a little bit about what I know about grief, but I would love to hear from you because again, it's not one size fits all. Everyone's experience is going to be different. And I do want you to know that grief doesn't only happen when there is death. I think we grieve more than we realize because there can be grief about desired pasts, right? Parents that I wanted, childhood that I wanted, relationships I craved or wished would have worked out. So we can grieve the loss of a relationship. We can grieve the loss of a job. And grief can come with illness or injury as well, right? We can wish that we weren't so sick so we could do this X, Y, Z or take this trip or I wish I hadn't broken my leg. I would have liked to have done that or, you know, lost a limb through cancer or other traumatic event and now I can't play the piano like I used to, right? We have to acknowledge those griefs. Like those are big griefs in our life and we have to make the space for them. We can also have what we call living grief where we grieve people who are still alive. Going back to like lost relationships, if we are still in love with someone, but we got a divorce or we broke up, we grieve that. We can wish our parents could be part of our lives, but we know that they can't, they're not capable. We can wish that we could get that relationship back. You know, they call that breakup grief. We could grieve the death of a dream. They talk about that a lot. I did some uh, CEUs, continuing education courses, about parents and when you're struggling to conceive and dealing with infertility, if you've had a miscarriage, any of that, obviously you've lost a child. I'm not trying to minimize that, but they said a big part of that is the death of the dream because when we find out we're pregnant, when we're trying to have a baby, we have a dream of what it's going to be like. We have a dream of what their life is going to look like and what we as a parent are going to look like. And we have to give ourselves an opportunity to grieve that loss as well as the loss of the child. I think that's kind of part of the reason why miscarriage can feel so devastating. We've not only lost a child, but there's the death of the dream. And some people might not even know about it, right? We can feel really isolated with it. And also I think it's important to know that grief can come and go. For a lot of us, especially with me, even with the loss of my dad, I would feel totally grief stricken, unable to leave the house, wanted to cry all the time. And then other days I'd be fine. I'd be able to go to school because I was in graduate school at the time. I'd go to my job, I'd do my homework and I could like get it together. And I think the therapist in me and the human in me is like, it's probably just my resilience, like my ability to like just white knuckle it and push through. Also, it just depends on, you know, things that remind me of him or things that are coming up that if for whatever we're grieving, if there's a trigger or a person mentions someone's name or you see a photo, right? Those things can bring you back too. Um, I also found that if I didn't sleep well, again, resilience, that I would be more tearful and sad if someone brought up his loss. And so I bring all that up to just let you know that grief isn't only about death. We don't, again, don't go through those stupid stages in that certain order. It can come and go. We can grieve people, places, things, dreams, all sorts of parts of our life. And a lot of people asked me to talk a little bit about complicated grief. So we're talking about, right, there's all these different types. It can be when someone passes away. It doesn't always have to be. When it comes to complicated grief, this can apply to any of the things we've talked about. This happens when the feelings of grief don't lessen over time. Now, you know, I don't like a time frame. That's why I'm just saying lessen over time. Because instead of lessening, they intensify. So instead of me being able to manage talking about the loss of my dad or the loss of my grandma or the loss of... I remember I applied for this, um, I wanted to go to Boston for graduate school and I didn't get into that program and I was devastated for a while. And like, if that grief didn't go away, now it almost seems like a joke to me because I'm like, could I have handled the winter? Maybe not, but I would have tried, <laughs> right? But if that grief didn't lessen over time, if it instead got more intense, that would be considered complicated grief. 
And this type of grief doesn't get any better without treatment. And I believe that this can happen for many reasons. For a lot of us, you know, we could have a history of mental health issues, making us more vulnerable to struggling with any life stressor, right? Because our resilience is usually more low. Like if we have anxiety or depression, OCD or issues with rumination, it, it can make us more predisposed to struggle with this grief and feel, feel it more intensely. Also, the relationship with the person that we've lost, whether this is like living grief, the person still exists, but they're not in our life, or whether they actually passed away, that relationship could have been complicated. Like a parent we haven't talked to in years because of past abuse or addiction. We could also have compounded grief. I mentioned that at the very, very beginning. But compounded grief is, you know, when we have lots of loss in a short period of time. And I think, I think that's part of what got me with this last string of loss in my family is we lost my papa in October of 2019. Um, he had COPD and he died of a heart attack, unfortunately, at the age of 86. So we lost him. And then in the next two years, we lost my aunt and my uncle. And then in 2023, no, 2022, December 2022, we lost my grandma. So that was like, boom. And that was all on my dad's side, which is the part of my family that I spend the most time with, that I'm the closest with, arguably. We lost them all. And that compounded loss can, can make for a difficult time in the grieving process. And it can cause complicated grief. And also, if it happens suddenly, we can struggle to come to terms with it. I find my patients and friends who have a sudden loss, whether that's a, a divorce that's abrupt, shakes them to their core, they're like, like completely blindsided by it, or someone who has an accident and dies that day. Um, one of my best friends growing up lost her sister to a car accident when we were in middle school, and that was really hard on her family and on me. It was so sudden. And I think I spent way, way, way more time in denial than I ever did with my dad or my grandma or anything like that because I still couldn't wrap my head around the fact that it had happened, right? So it can take us a lot longer to come to terms with it. And also there can be some hangups in the process, right? Like we weren't able to see them one last time, say what we wanted to say, or maybe someone stopped us from being around them. I've heard that from a lot of you, that you have one member of your family that doesn't really give you access to your ailing family member. And that sucks. Or maybe, a, you know, your, let's say your parent got remarried and their new partner doesn't like your part of the family, so you don't get to see them anymore. And that can make it really hard too. And so there can be anger and resentment, again, complicating it. And also just to kind of reiterate the fact that we can struggle with this due to stigma. The assumption that we should be able to just move on move through it. People can, you know, they forget that we went through a devastating loss. I remember, and this will always stick with me, I actually just thought about reaching out to a friend of mine who'd lost someone recently because it's been a while since the loss. But when my dad died, um, everybody's there at the beginning and you're overwhelmed. Like I'm talking dissociate, like boo, it's just overwhelming. You're like all cried out. You're you, my mom and I joked that we were like the ladies in mourning. Cause I grew up in a super small town, you guys. So we'd need to go out for a walk, just get out of the fucking house. And people would like stop their cars on the road and be like, I'm so sorry. We, we heard, Oh, we love you guys for anything. You know, and it's just exhausting. You're like, I don't want to talk about it anymore. And people mean, it's not that we're upset with people. It's just like, sometimes you're so wiped out by it. Right. And so that was just overwhelming for a few weeks. And everybody brings you tons of food and you have a shit ton of dead flowers in your house that smell terrible. And a few weeks go by and then life returns. And it's like, people just forget. And not because I expect people to still do what they were doing, but life goes on. Right. And my mom's friend, Ida, she reached out about two months after my dad died. And she, because she'd lost her husband a few years before, he's one of the, he's a really close friend with my dad. And she said, I just wanted to check in on you. And I wondered if you want to get lunch because I know people forget, but I didn't forget. And I know it doesn't get easier right away. And that, ooh, it even makes me tear up just thinking about it because that was the actual support that my mom needed. Someone who knew had been there before herself, knew that people forget and move on. And she checked in later. So if you have a friend or family member who has been lost or you're going through grief for anything, even I have a lot of friends, unfortunately, going through divorce right now. And I, as weird as it is to say it this way, I try to not forget. 
I try to ask them how they're doing with that, check in on them. Because I don't want them to think that I just assume life goes on as usual and that they're not completely rocked by this, right? It takes time. It takes years sometimes to settle. And so just that always just reminds me that it's like people forget and life moves on, but those of us who are grieving know that it doesn't, you know, things don't move on that quickly. And I want to end this video by sharing some of the things that helped me move through it because even though I'm getting teary talking about Ida because that was so sweet, it has gotten a lot better, like so much better. And obviously therapy, talking about it with a therapist, getting some insight, having a place to cry about it where I didn't feel judged like, oh, I should be moving through this more quickly. Why do I still feel this way? That was incredibly helpful. Group therapy, also helpful. If you were a caretaker of a loved one and they passed away, hospices have great, great resources for this. If you need support and you're going through divorce. Um, one of my neighbors went through a divorce and she was so active with this divorcee group. And I got to meet some of them because she'd have pool parties and I'd go over. And it was great to see them just sharing in their stories, feeling supported by one another, all going through it together. So I cannot recommend therapy enough, no matter what kind of loss you're struggling with. Also talking about it with others and reminiscing the good times. Um, I love spending time with people who knew them and talking about the goofy things and the funny stories that you all have. When I took, uh, I became a grief counselor, a certified grief counselor through this hospice in San Diego. One of the tools that they had me use with patients was to, you could do this in any kind of way, but the way they had us do it was get like an empty wicker wreath and get a bunch of random pieces of fabric or ribbon and sit with your loved ones and your family and as you recall those happy events or those goofy stories, oh, remember that time they fell over and did this? Or remember when they tried to make that food and it didn't turn out very good? Or remember when we went on that great vacation? There's all sorts of memories. You tie, you can even write something on it if there's space, but you tie that ribbon on to like commemorate that memory. And I found that to be really helpful with a lot of my patients. I found that to be beneficial myself. I used to have that wreath from my dad in my house, it's somewhere, it's probably in a container somewhere during the move, but I kept it up in my office for a really, really long time. And it's just a nice, it's a nice memory. You like look at it and it, it's, it's warmed my heart. So you can give yourself that, you know, as a, as a random craft project and also letting myself feel it, which totally sucks feeling sad, missing someone, feeling down, it's exhausting. I don't think anybody talks enough about how heavy grief is. I think we talk about it like, oh, it happens, it's a bummer, we, our, our life stops for a bit, and then you know our, our life moves on. But the heaviness, I've, I've shared this with many of you, but my, my therapist at the time had told me that it's like, life through an 80 pound backpack or 70 pound backpack. I forget how much she said it weighed, but flew this heavy backpack on my back and told me to go do what I needed to do every day to keep doing those things. And she was like, of course you're tired. You know, life through this heavy ass backpack on you. You can't keep doing that. And anybody who hikes or camps, you know, does like long hiking things, you know that the weight of your backpack really matters because it, even if you just try to hold on to something, like if I held the DSM and walked around with it all day, my arms would get so tired because it's extra weight. And grief is that extra weight. So if you find yourself being super exhausted, know that it's okay to take breaks. You don't have to hold yourself to that old example of what you could complete because right now you have that backpack on you. And until you take that backpack off, meaning talk about it in therapy and go through it, figure out what's in there, what's really weighing you down. Is it because it's complicated because the relationship was complicated? Is it because, you know, you felt like you never got to say what you really wanted to say to them? Is it because you're really missing them right now? What is it? You know, let's go through it and acknowledge it because that, that part was the hardest, but the most beneficial and allowed me to really move through it. And I know feeling, feeling sucks, but it really, really helps. And the final thing that helped me was, you know, not expecting it to go away right away. Not expecting myself to, to jump back up and be able to do everything that I used to be able to do. I think 
we always talk about grief. That's why I hate those stages is the expectation that we move to acceptance, that somehow grief goes away. Poof, like it never existed. Like we'll stop missing them. Like we won't see something they made for us and want to cry. I think if we can stop expecting it to go away and instead for it, for my life instead to grow around it and get bigger so that the grief doesn't feel so big anymore. Because sometimes I feel like there was a beautiful drawing. If I can find it, I'll have Sean put it up on the screen. But this beautiful animation or actually just a still image on Instagram, it was these little characters and it, it was like grief comes in like a meteor, like and it like fucks your life up, right? And it takes up all this space. It's really big and you can't even see around it. And you think that it's gonna get smaller, that the grief will slowly get smaller and go away, but you learn through time that that's not what happens. The grief is, it's, it is fine. It like stays as it is, but my life grows and I, in, you know, I grow in a relationship with Sean. I get married. I, I get to grow in our community. I, I, I wrote a book. Things happen in your life. You maybe get a job opportunity. You meet a new friend. You move to a new city. You get these new things. You do these new things. You have new experiences and your life starts to grow. And your life grows so large that the grief feels smaller even though it's the same size it was when it happened. And so I want us to stop expecting grief just to go away. I want us to stop stigmatizing people or even ourselves, judging ourselves for it taking us a while to move through it. And I want us to know that grief happens when people don't pass away. We can grieve a lot of different things in our lives and we really need to normalize talking about that. But I'd love to hear from you. Are there pieces of grief you felt like I left out? please let me know. I'd love you to share in your stories. If you have a happy story, you really feel like you want to share about a loved one that was lost or a relationship that is no longer, feel free to share those funny and loving stories in the comments down below. Take care of yourselves. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.